Hi, this is Ron Sipsick. In this particular video, we're going to take a look at the concept of societal surplus and how that relates to the market model. The easiest way to, uh, to wade into this is to take a look at a hypothetical product. So let's suppose that there's a buyer considering a meal. And the buyer has a maximum price that he will pay for the meal. And let's say that maximum price is $18 for the meal. Now, of course, the buyer hopes to pay less for the meal than $18. And there are people out there selling the meal for less than $18. So the buyer is going to find that he can be satisfied. The minimum price of the meal will actually be set by the seller. And the seller, let's say the seller in question is willing to take as little as $8 for the meal. <coughs> Excuse me. So the buyer clearly has an opportunity here and the seller has an opportunity because you can see that there's a considerable space between the maximum price and the minimum price. The buyer is willing to pay as much as 18. The seller is willing to take as little as 8. There's room for mutually advantageous trade here. So let's just assume that the actual price, I'll just sketch a, sketch a line in here. Let's just say that the actual price of the meal will be 12. And that's the actual price. And that price is determined by market conditions. If there's lots of sellers in town, that price might be quite low. If there's lots of buyers in town relative to sellers, that price might be high. So the actual price uh, is determined by market conditions. We're going to just place it at 12 and we see that the uh, the buyer wins as a result of this price. The buyer would pay as much as 18, only has to pay 12. So the buyer is actually getting six dollars of value that he didn't pay for. That has actually got a name. That's called consumer surplus. So this gap between 18, this gap between 18 and 12 is six and that gap is called consumer surplus. And, and again, that's value the consumer receives but doesn't pay for. I'll write that out in a minute down below. Notice the producer also wins. Why? Because the producer would bring the product to market for as little as eight. And that must include a profit. If the seller's going to bring it to market, the seller must expect at least a minimal profit. So $8 is sufficient to cover all of the seller's costs and to bring the seller a profit. But the seller is actually able to sell the meal for more than 8 is able to sell it for 12 That $4 gap is called producer surplus. Producer surplus is value the pr producer receives above what is required to bring it to market. That's $4 in this case. You can see that there's a $10 gap between the maximum price and the minimum price. And that gap, which is really a trading zone, that gap is divided between the consumer and producer. Well, let's go ahead and define, write out formal definitions for consumer surplus and producer surplus. Let's define them. So consumer surplus... in this case six dollars is value the consumer or buyer receives but doesn't pay for so in essence, if you think about this, the consumer is actually getting something for free. The consumer would pay as much as 18, only pays 12, gets $6 of value that he didn't pay for. On the other side of the equation, there's something called producer surplus. And producer surplus in this case is $4. What is it? It's the value the producer or seller receives above what is required. So the seller, the seller requires a minimum of eight 
is happy to receive 12 for the meal, walks away with $4 of producer surplus. Now, if we go ahead and scroll down further, I've pre-drawn the market model, and we can see that uh, the concepts of producer surplus and consumer surplus can be applied uh, to the market model. Before I do that, however, let me just j let me just define societal surplus as long as we're writing out definitions. If you take consumer surplus plus producer surplus, you get societal surplus. So if you take the six dollars plus the four dollars, you get societal surplus of ten dollars. That ten dollars is actually societal welfare. In other words, the world is ten dollars better off, this consumer and this producer are ten dollars better off if this meal is produced and sold. So societal surplus is actually a socially valuable um, amount. It's a it's really a form of wealth that the uh, consumer and producer enjoy as a result of engaging in mutually advantageous trade. Notice both consumer and producer are walking away from the deal feeling like they got something that they would not have gotten had they not entered into the deal. Now, we can uh, label this. This is the supply curve. This is the demand curve. Price axis up here. Quantity axis down here. This is the equilibrium price. This is the equilibrium quantity. Now, the price that the consumer would pay maximum can be shown as a point on the demand curve. So the consumer is willing to pay as much as $18. That is the maximum price possible. That is taken off the demand curve. So the demand curve tells us what a particular buyer is willing to pay for a particular product. We'll just uh, assume for the sake of argument that the unit we're looking at is the first unit. It could be any unit between one and QE. Okay, now the equilibrium price, we'll just assume for the sake of argument, is the actual price. And the actual price, as we said earlier, is 12. So we can see here that this gap between 18 and 12 represents the consumer surplus that we talked about up here. So this shaded area right here is consumer surplus. And we can define consumer surplus graphically as the area below the demand curve and above the price line. And you can see that for every unit between 1 and QE, the consumer gets at least some consumer surplus. You also notice that consumer surplus is diminishing as we move from 1 to QE. Why? Because buyers that are added, in other words, you have to lower your price to get more buyers involved, those buyers that are added are actually lower valued buyers. In other words, they don't value the product as much as the first buyer. And so they don't enjoy as much consumer surplus from the product as the first buyer. All right? So the shaded area below the demand curve above the supply curve is consumer surplus. Now, the producer um, is willing to take as little as $8 for this product that minimum price is taken off of the supply curve. So what the supply curve says is that first unit could be sold for as little as eight. And so we can see producer surplus as the distance between the equilibrium price and the minimum price. Now I'm going to shade that in with a different coloring scheme here. Just shade it in much... Uh, my shading is a little more complete here. And that is our producer surplus. Okay? And you can see that for every unit between 1 and QE that there is going to be at least some producer surplus for the producers that are involved. Now this is a market so we can assume that there's more than one producer. Okay? And so every unit between 1 and QE provides the consumer with at least some consumer surplus and the producer with at least some producer surplus. Until you get out to PEQE on this very last unit, the consumer and the producer get no consumer surplus or no producer surplus. So this entire shaded area below the demand curve, above the supply curve, is what we call societal surplus. And you can see that 
this distance 6 plus this distance 4 adds up to $10 on the first unit. Okay, so societal surplus is graphically the distance between the demand curve and the supply curve. Now, what is unusual about the equilibrium point? Well, we know that the equilibrium point is where the market tends to gravitate to, but the news gets better. That equilibrium point is actually the point where we maximize total societal surplus. So as a market moves towards equilibrium, as a market moves towards an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity, it is maximizing societal surplus. And this is a good thing. Both consumers and producers win when the market is operating in equilibrium. Okay, now what I'd like to show you to wrap up this lesson is what happens when the market is distorted and how this can reduce the amount of societal surplus. So once again we have a supply, supply curve and demand curve model. Here's the supply curve, here's the demand curve, price axis, quantity axis. This is the equilibrium price, this is the equilibrium quantity. Now suppose that the government Suppose that the government imposes what is called a price ceiling. A price ceiling is a price above which the seller may not charge. So a price ceiling is actually a, a limit on how high the price can go. And the price ceiling is going to be set below equilibrium. Why? Because the intention is to keep the price from getting up to equilibrium. Well, if you hold the price below equilibrium, you're going to create a shortage. The quantity demanded will be out here. The quantity supplied will be over here. This gap between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded is called a shortage. Now, what effect does this have on the welfare of consumers and producers? Well, anyone who is able to buy this product at the ceiling price, PC, is going to get this level of consumer surplus. So you can see that each consumer who is able to buy the product gets a considerable amount of consumer surplus. Why? Because the price is being held artificially low. You will notice, however, that because the price is being held artificially low, the market does not produce at equilibrium, it produces at QS which means the market production rate is reduced as a result of the ceiling. The producer, on the other hand, gets the area below the price and above the supply curve. So the producer is only going to get this area here. So you can see that societal surplus has been reduced. Why? Well, consumer surplus may in fact have gotten larger. In fact, it did because this square area here which has been added to it is greater than this triangle which has been lost. So consumer surplus has increased, but producer surplus has been dramatically decreased. So again, this area up here is consumer surplus. This area down here is producer surplus. Now here's the problem. Here's the rub. This black area right here has been lost this was part of societal surplus. This is lost societal surplus. So by causing the market to underproduce, operate at QS rather than QE, what the government has essentially done is reduce the level of societal surplus. It's actually transferred some of the societal surplus to consumers it's reduced producer surplus dramatically, and it's led to a loss, um, a loss of societal surplus. So again, back to the original point, if the market operates in equilibrium, if it's free to operate in equilibrium, you get the entire shaded area between... I don't understand. Oh, here is consumer surplus. Oh, this area excuse down. me. Here is surplus. So here's the problem. Excuse me. Siri is talking to me. I have to lost. shut off my phone. Sorry about that. So again, sorry for the interruption. When the market operates in equilibrium, we're going to capture the entire area below the demand curve and the entire area above the supply curve. 
we see this entire shaded area here and that is captured if the market's allowed to operate at equilibrium. But if the market is not allowed to operate at equilibrium, there is a real possibility that societal surplus will be lost. Okay? So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on societal surplus and how it applies to the market model. Uh, the merits of markets uh, are many, but one of the merits of markets is that when a market operates, it tends to move towards equilibrium and equilibrium is actually an optimal outcome with respect to societal surplus.